Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're talking about trends in cloud computing. First, we'll take a look at the skills gap and how that affects digital transformation. Then we'll dig into an interesting new idea called the super cloud and what that says about the future of cloud computing. To discuss that, I'm joined by David Linthicum, Chief Cloud Strategy Officer at Deloitte Consulting. Dave, very good to talk with you today. Yeah, it's great to be here, James. It's uh, fun stuff. Happy Friday. <laughs> Happy Friday to you. Uh, let's talk about the skills gap. I mean, and, and how that's impacting digital transformation. It feels like we we cannot find enough cloud experts. Seems like every every mom and dad across the world, uh, you know, America, the world, wherever, says, you know, children, please grow up to be cloud experts. You'll never be unemployed. What what what's happening with the cloud skills gap these days? Well, uh, the demand is outpaced the supply, mm -hmm. and so I think the supply is actually ramped up a bit. And certainly, remote learning and certifications and college universities adopting uh, 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 cloud skills, um, you know, including including the hat that I'm wearing now, um, has. I'm sorry, uh, you're, you're you're wearing is it, what is that is it LSU hat. Yeah, LSU had. I, I, uh, I'm an adjunct. I, I do the do some of the remote content there. I've been doing it for years. Okay. Um, but the idea is that uh, we're going to provide training any way we can, and it's going to be remote learning. It's going to be um, uh, college and universities. A lot of community colleges are adopting cloud programs, so people are going back and getting their second degrees mm -hmm. uh, in cloud computing to get into the field. But it's just not happening fast enough. So you know, moving forward. Um, this is something that we have to kind of either curtail the demand, which I don't see happening, or really kind of increase the supply. So we have to get people interested in, in cloud computing early on in their career. And I think that it uh, doesn't necessarily have the allure, you know, when you're in college as, you know, other careers go. Uh, however, it, to your point, it's very interesting, it's a very consistent job. And it's also, I find it just kind of very challenging. And so, the ability to kind of get uh, groups interested in cloud computing that may not be in there now and the, at the at the, uh, the the rate that we'd like, um, you know, talking about women specifically, mm -hmm. uh, and the ability to kind of recruit them and provide them with opportunities to get into the field. I mean, one of the things we do at Deloitte is we have a um, a key group of of women who are re-entering the workforce, you know, after leaving it for several years and putting the training in them and getting them up to speed and then getting them engaged and back into the workforce. And you, you gotta have those sorts of programs in place to really kind of mine the areas of the market that aren't necessarily mined these days. And so, you know, putting the equity stuff aside, it's just good business. And, and the ability to kind of get out there and recruit areas that aren't, are underserved uh, is really, I think, going to be the answer to the problem. You know, one of the uh, you know one of the colleagues that are working at Deloitte, um, she stated, you know, something very profound. We're not getting to the root of the issue. We're we're trying to recruit the same few people, but we're not necessarily filling the supply chain with the people who are going to be qualified to kind of take their businesses to the next level. And so, that's a problem. I think we have to solve holistically. And I, I think that we're moving to make things happen. We're having you know little. Uh, you know, areas of brightness that are occurring. You know, for example, the reentry services we're doing Deloitte and other people are doing similar things, other firms, other companies, mm -hmm. but we're going to have to kind of step it up because right now the progress is being hindered by the fact that we just can't get the talent. So, you know, we're obviously going to be really busy and we're happy about that. But at the end of the day, we want people in the organization when we throw the keys to them in terms of the cloud migration or whatever systems are standing up, they're going to have the ability to operate it and keep it moving. And that's in jeopardy right now. So any, every one of, uh, you know, uh, people are hindered in cloud computing. It's not, we're having issues with the technology or something. It's that we want to move at 20 miles an hour. We can only move at 10 right. because we just don't have enough people to get us forward and they can't compromise and start to hiring uh, lesser talent individuals because that's just going to get them in trouble. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. Well, I mean, you've talked about this a little bit. I mean, I, say there's some hypothetical company out there and they, they really need uh, more cloud professionals. They can't find them. How can they how can an individual company deal with that problem, hire and train professionals to keep pace with clouds, you know, rapid growth? Yeah, I think you have to uh, be a bit more aggressive uh, in terms of recruiting and training. Uh, so, which is a bit risky because you can recruit and train them and they could end up going on and moving on to another company. So 
you're looking at individuals that may not have all the qualifications you're looking for, and then you're going to build those individuals. You're going to bring them into a training program. They're going to do remote learning, any college and universities, you know, the different, uh, you know, different uh, learning uh, outlets out there, LinkedIn Learning and Cloud Guru and things like that, mm-hmm. and get them through a training program in a rather slow period, of, in, a, in a quick period of time, and then get them onto a project or getting onto some sort of an effort that's going on where they can kind of learn on the job. So we do a couple of things. Number one, we're taking someone who may not have the skills that we need, we're providing them with the basic skills moving forward and then getting into an entry level position, you know, where they can grow their skills. Right now, I, I, and I see this happen a lot, people are demanding that someone have a college degree, people are demanding that someone have a certain certification level, people are demanding that they have a computer science degree, whatever, even go to a particular college. I see that sometimes. That doesn't really in, get, a, get to a productive end. People who don't have college degrees or uh, can pick up cloud computing and be very successful with it. Um, people who, you know, haven't gone to certain colleges or gone to community colleges, you know, should be recruited because they're just, they can pick up the same sort of skills and get into the mix. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to be a little bit more pragmatic about, um, and I'm talking about the industry now, um, holistically in who's going to be hired and what kind of talent profile that they have. And, I think the days of throwing resumes out because they don't fulfill some sort of a minor filter are, are behind us. And I think if you're doing it right now, you're leaving a lot of you're leaving a lot of uh, money on the table because you have very motivated, uh, very creative, very innovative people that are going to be great employees and take your business to the next level that may not have the initial qualifications on paper that you're looking for. So we have to be a little bit more open minded in how we're recruiting and hiring people. Definitely. And I, I, there's, here's a question I, you may not be able to answer, but I'm just curious what your sense is of how much of a shortage is it? Say, you know, we, we need, you know, a hypothetical 100 employees, we only have 50, or is it like we, we need 100, we have like 75? I mean, is there a way to semi-quantify how, how short we are, really? Yeah, I'd say it's, it's probably about 70% of, of the uh, demand is being met. Uh, sorry, that that is being asked for. So, uh, thirty to forty percent of jobs out there are going unfil- unfilled, mm-hmm. uh, and that's not just a few months. It's taking us three months to fill the job, like some recruiters used to do. Uh, they're just not being filled. We're not getting the recruits. We're not getting the applicants to make it happen, and they're typically not being proactive in doing so. So, if people are telling me that they're waiting for people to show up at their door um, to become a qualified applicant. They're not out there. Uh, aggressively recruiting and also, like I said, start taking more creative and innovative ways to do it. So step out of your comfort zone and get into areas where they may not be able to have the skills or the the experience on paper, recruit them, give them a position, train them, get them into the organization, assimilate them into the culture, assimilate in the way of doing something. And you're going to have a much more, uh, you know, greater response. You're going to fill a lot of positions you couldn't fill. Right now, it's it's one of these things where they're not filling the positions, hmm. and people are standing there with their arms folded. And I'm not sure that's the way you solve the issue. It's not going to solve itself. We have to be proactive, get down to the supply chain, do things that are different ways of doing it. You know, r- recruiting, uh, re- recruiting groups that normally aren't recruited, and the ability to kind of look at things with more of an open mind. Mm-hmm. Wait, and you yourself have a LinkedIn course. Is that true on cloud? Yeah, I, I got a bunch of them. Uh, and and it's, um, you know, a way in which we can, you know, start building, you know, tech, uh, building technology. I mean, uh, the you're building skills and building uh, uh, profiles and kind of understanding the way things go. We have Deloitte Cloud Institute, which actually uses those, those LinkedIn courses, but other courses as well. Hmm. And one of the things you need to do, if you're going to be a professional in this in this uh, in this uh, world, you know, is go out there and volunteer your time and give away some time and doing some education. I mean, education is kind of I've you know, I've taught college since I was younger, uh, you know, since I was in my 20s. And mm-hmm. the reality is, there's a certain amount of passion that has to go along with that because we're just, we're we're giving education down to people that can benefit you. Right. So, you know, it's so funny, the, the education, things like that. Well, you know, cool, you're teaching a course, but the reality is you get recruits that come in uh, if you're educating people uh, because they're they're going to follow you into the company mm-hmm. and you're going to get interest. And also you're going to think about new, and more innovative ways in which we're, we're taking technology to the next level. So it's not just me. We have a bunch of people at Deloitte that teach courses and teach at colleges and volunteer and all these sorts of things. 
And there's a selfish angle to that because we're able to get more recruits from making that happen. We're able to reach out and touch more people who are interested in, you know, working for Deloitte and going around a certain skill set. Mm -hmm. But I think it's an obligation as an industry as a whole. We have to, you know, spend some time teaching. Everybody, you know, complains about the fact we don't have enough skills out there, yet I don't see them proactively in the market uh, solving that issue. It's just, it's just more arms folded complaining. And again, it's not going to, it's not going to get solved. Right, right. Now there's, there's a lot of people out there who could use the opportunities. I, I'd love to see that, that, that base grow. Um, ch changing topics, uh, still on cloud, changing channel, so to speak. The idea of super cloud, which, which I find really fascinating because I, I feel like I'm pretty well versed in the, in the area of cloud terminology, but I don't hear super cloud that much. It feels like a newer term. From what I make of it, it feels like it's kind of an umbrella system or a larger system that goes over the many clouds that we have. It could be thought of as a multi-cloud management system. Correct me if I'm completely off base. What, what, what is super cloud, Dave? Yeah, super cloud is really uh, an abstract layer of technology we're building above the clouds, and it's it's a logical layer. So physically, it may run on any number of clouds or some of the on-premise systems, but the idea is fairly simple. What we're doing is saying instead of building separate, um, particular specific technologies in silos, in other words, having security for one cloud provider, having a different security level for another, and a different security level for the third, and typically things that are native to their environments that the cloud providers are selling, the ability to leverage one holistic security system is able to cover all of the security needs of all the particular cloud providers. And so we're moving away from implementing things that are going to be natively on a cloud and only solve the problem within that particular walled garden and siloed provider of the cloud and be able to do it holistically across multiple clouds. And so that's taking security, operations management, which is every, how everybody's confusing it today. They're going, well, that's you know, cloud management platform or AI ops. And it's part of that, but it's lots of different stuff. Security is in there, governance is in there, operations is in there, FinOps is in there, uh, performance management, data management, even common database systems, and even common development platforms that are federated, that are able to, you know, uh, create uh, applications and databases at one central level and deploy on each particular native cloud and how they want to do it. Mm -hmm. So all those things are there. And it really needs to think about what that stack is, how we're building these cross cloud services and really kind of normalizing things that are very complex. We're dealing with everything on, in standing up a service to solve whatever tactical problem we're looking to solve. We have to figure out ways to do these with common services or else the complexity is just gonna to be too daunting for us to operate. And so we're seeing that now in the marketplace, they're calling it the complexity wall, hmm. where they're hitting a point where they just have so many services under management, so many resources, so many databases, so many AI systems, and they're easy to stand up because we were able to you know, turn them on on a particular cloud provider and provision them and get them running fairly quickly. But in terms of operating these things, they're overly complex. And so the super cloud, the meta cloud, I don't really care what anybody calls it, it is this logical layer of technology, physically exists on all kinds of different platforms where we're dealing with cross cloud services. So we're solving the problem once in trying to, instead of solving the problem on each and each platform that's there and the technology is starting to become available. You know, AI ops, uh, common databases, you know, common application services, federated containers, all these things are starting to emerge. And enterprises are thinking uh, very uh, clearly about figuring out how that's going to work because those are deploying multi-clouds. Mm -hmm. They're just getting a taste of it now, by the way. It's not a huge, huge issue. They're seeing the complexity coming up. They can't afford the operational control. And so when they're figuring out something, that's going to be more holistic. And by the way, the great thing about that, it's not just the cloud, but we can plug in the legacy systems underneath it under the same sort of security framework, the same FinOps framework underneath it, mm -hmm. and really kind of solve the problem for the enterprise, you know, versus trying to, you know, make these little fiefdoms, these little silos within the enterprises that have their own little solutions that just goes to the complexity, goes to the operational effort that, that it's going to take to make this thing work. Well, it, it seems like it could, it could come in a different number of different flavors. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a major technology vendor. I won't, I won't say their name, but they uh, they promote their products as, oh, yeah, we know you have an, an AWS instance. We know you have an Azure instance. We're going to handle the space between those two things. So that might be one flavor. The other flavor is I, there's another large vendor who will remain unnamed, not one of the leading hyperscalers. And this vendor says, hey, We've got a multi-cloud management platform. You can actually manage your clouds. You can also manage your in-house and your storage too. So it's actually almost a single pane of glass. They don't quite claim that. 
So are, is, is both that leading tech, the leading security vendor, and then that other other multi so quote unquote multi cloud vendor, are both those examples of super cloud? Those, those would both be examples of people who say they're a contender to be in a super cloud stack. <laughs> okay. Each of those cloud providers, because one of the things when I started to cover this um, is everybody came up to me and they said, well, we've been selling super cloud for 10 years and they really haven't. They may have been selling a component of it or something that's going to become come the stack. But you have to remember, this is a very uh, wide ranging thing with lots of different patterns in it. So it's going to have different security systems and operation systems, certainly the CMPs and AI ops where they provide the single pane of glass of stuff. But the most important thing is not necessarily having the visibility in the system, but providing less redundant and more simplistic frameworks and how you're dealing with technology. Because the, the thing that concerns me and, and what we just talked about the skill shortage, this is just gonna make it worse. If we start deploying whatever technology we want to and we're leveraging best of breed technology and people are you know, certainly allowed to do that, but we're replicating security and we're replicating governance and replicating database management that's going to run into so many services we're going to have a, a heterogeneity problem and where we need to instead of keeping 10 different skill sets around to run uh, major aspects of the platform we need to keep uh, 100 skill sets around to run the same sort of platform with the same sort of revenue and the same sort of roi that's coming back from the systems that won't scale and so they're just saying and what i'm telling people now is don't push back on best of breed um, you know, that's always going to be a, uh, uh, a good, uh, a good way to look at it. But, um, I mean, don't push back on best of breed, but provide abstraction and automation to allow you to leverage that technology in a way that's going to allow operations to scale. And so that's where the kind of the super cloud goes in. It's an abstraction automation layer, cross cloud services as much as we can, but it has, you know, hundreds of different technologies that are in that stack that we need to run that. So there's not going to be one technology component that's going to make up what a super cloud is. So what would what would you say to those people who say, hey, and you've mentioned this a little bit, uh, hey, we have AI ops, so we're, we're, we're doing super cloud because we have AI ops. Yeah, I would say you're doing, okay, you have an operational stack that, you know, solves uh, one of the 20 problems you need to solve. You know, what about governance? Um, what about security? Uh, what about FinOps? Mm -hmm. uh, what about cross cloud management, database management, metadata management, you know, all these things that kind of come into play that if you're going to be in for a penny or in for a pound, we're going to provide these very cross cloud services to make these things happen. You have to figure out all the basic things that we're doing cross cloud systems. So we're moving them from the particular native deployments up into a larger layer of abstraction using one product versus one on every cloud or even, you know, 10 on every cloud in some instances. So you're only solving an aspect of that it's a much more larger strategic problem. Um, and so we have bits and pieces of the technology today that are able to make up what a super cloud is, or at least the way which, which we're defining it. But there's no perfect stack that's yet deployed as to what it is and what it's looking to be. So I think I know what it is. And I think a lot of the uh, influencers and thought leaders in the cloud space understand what that is. But as far as filling it in with particular pieces of technology and what they, what they do, uh, it probably hasn't progressed to that yet. Okay. So we know it's AI ops, we know it's FinOps, which you know runs across multi-cloud. We know it's common database services and common security, but there's dozens of other things that need to be part of that as well to make it a holistic, useful platform. It can be thought of as virtualization at the most meta level. Yeah. Correct, or, or not exactly. No, I, I think I think that's fair term that we're not, I mean, we can certainly Put virtualized systems under a super cloud, but the what we're doing is providing an abstraction layer where we're dealing with things that are fairly complex in the most simplest terms. So we're dealing with storage as storage, but the concept of storage, not necessarily the way uh, the cloud providers do block storage and object storage and different providers and different brands, things like that. And therefore providing a simplistic abstraction layer for dealing with storage. And so the, the way in which you're deploying underneath is really kind of removed from us. So we can get, we can get wiggy with the underlying technology. We can pick, pick any kind of storage system, database system, AI system, ML system we want, but it's able to snap into a common framework. We're able to address these things through commonality uh, and across the clouds. Mm -hmm. And so I think abstraction is probably a better, uh, a better way to look at it. Um, but it certainly is, you know, if you think about virtual databases, 
they're abstract databases. Your ability to kind of create a single schema that exists in memory that's able to map down to physical instances. Mm -hmm. Very, very similar as, uh, as of analogy. But we're doing so with security. We're doing so with governance. We're doing so with, with uh, operations and all these other sorts of things. So what we're doing is just kind of bringing sanity to an over complexity that's going to be heading our way. And we, are, we understand we're not going to be able to make this stuff scale and make it work without some sort of a valid framework and how we're going to deal with complexity. Um, you know, one of the things we have Deloitte, and we've had this many years ago, we did cloud complexity management as a framework. So okay. thought leadership and, you know, uh, uh, courses on stuff is that we saw this stuff coming in the fact that complexity mediation is going to be a very uh, important thing to do and created a framework and created an understanding before it actually started to show up. Now it's starting to show up. And really the answer to that, and we put this in the cloud complexity management framework is really a super cloud. If you put cloud complexity management framework, you know, it's about the ability to kind of take these silos and create this abstraction layer and manage them as one layer. Now it's doing so at a conceptual level, but you just have to take the conceptual level that logical architecture and implementing it into a physical architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it, it seems if I think about market competition, which is not what all of our enterprise IT is about, but it's, it's a big driver in that, it seems like the emergence of super cloud seems to de-emphasize the leading hyperscalers because these these three big giants and perhaps the two or three of the second tier hyperscalers are really big leaders. They've got this big gravitational pull, but with the super cloud, they become subsumed in, into a, a, a part of a larger system. Correct or not necessarily? Not necessarily. In fact, I think the hyperscalers are going to end up making bank uh, out of the appearance of a super cloud. If you think about it, we're making utilization of those underlying pr more primitive resources that exist within the cloud providers right. easier and more pragmatic to leverage. Uh -huh. And so in doing so, we're going to leverage more storage and more compute, things like that. What we, what we may not see is much of these proprietary da are these, these dashboards that are really kind of around the wall of the garden with particular cloud providers. And therefore, we don't have to deal with the dashboard of one versus the other versus the other, whether it's storage, compute, AI, all these things. They have dashboards for everything. But we're dealing with one common framework that, and one common layer of abstraction where we're uh, addressing all these underlying services. And so, you know, we may have gone to, you know, from 1,000 services within a single cloud to 4,000 services across three clouds. And, but instead of dealing with whatever dashboards we are and having human beings deal with that, we're putting a layer of stuff above it so we can manage those 4,000 services, which is kind of so complex. It's out of the array of understanding and the number of people and skills we can keep around mm -hmm. using automation and abstraction to, to deal with those using one common layer. So they shouldn't push back on this. I think it's going to be in, enhance cloud adoption. People are afraid and stopping cloud adoption around the complexity aspect of it. I'm seeing that all the time. Hmm. Skills is an issue and this will address the skills things. We're able to do uh, much more with a lot less skills mm -hmm. uh, making it happen. So I just see their marketing and market accelerating or main, certainly maintaining the same. So I've heard the argument where you're going to commoditize the cloud providers. No, you're not. You still have to get storage and compute and databases and all these things from someplace. And by the way, this the aspects and the, the components that run in the super cloud have to run someplace. And that's typically gonna be a cloud provider. So even they physically run on a cloud provider, they're operating across clouds. So uh, their business in Flex continues to be very strong for some time. They may have to change their way in which they adopt and sell within the marketplace, mm -hmm. which I do seeing a few of them today, You know, mm -hmm. moving forward, um, but the market's gonna push them in that direction. So they're just making, assumptions that probably just aren't going to be correct if you look at the outlook of the market. Just like yeah. you saw in the pandemic hit, they said, well, cloud computing is going to tank now, right? And uh, it, it had it, unintended consequences, unintended effects, and people have to understand what the likely reaction is going to be. Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, cloud was one of the big winners of, of the pandemic. There's no, no question about that. Um, yeah. Is there such a thing as, as, as winners and losers as, as super cloud emerges and, and or is there a certain vendor that you think and you may maybe loathe to, to push a certain vendor, but is there a certain vendor who has an advantage in, in the world of, of super cloud at this moment? Yeah, can't can't list the vendors. Right. Um, Didn't yeah, think so. that's yeah. all. Yeah. Trusted advisor. You know, sure. That kind of stuff. Yeah, but I think the winners are going to be that are going to make more of an inflection of the super cloud are going to be anything that exists in the middle. So that's going to be AI ops. That's going to be 
uh, FinOps, um, you know, FinOps players, cost monitoring systems that operate across clouds and across systems. Mm -hmm. That's going to be data management, data governance that, that goes across systems. That's going to be security management, not only just security, but identity access management systems, cross cloud directories, anything that's able to span clouds and does so in a, in a reasonably good way, which is kind of what like AI ops is designed to be built for. Mm -hmm. They're going to do great because I think that's where the need's going to be. So it's going to be focused on these technologies. Mm -hmm. And by the way, some of them may be sold by a hyperscaler at some point. They can get into a market fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to operate across clouds. Anything that does that over the next three to five years uh, is going to do very well because people are going to be searching out laser-like focus for that technology. Uh, if you're just selling something that only runs on a particular provider and it can't run across providers, you can use that as a point system unto itself and it's going to grow just fine, but it's not going to inflect as much as the stuff that would go in the super cloud. Well, all right, you mentioned the three to five year figures that, that brings us to the, the future. Um, what, what, what is the future of super cloud? I would assume that if, it, if, the, if, the, if the idea fully gains currency across the whole market, um, it, it will be the, the reigning technology by say, you know, mid decade or so. I mean, what, what, what do you see as the future of super cloud? Yeah, I, I think everything cloud just becomes baked into technology. So in other words, if you think about it, it's everything we do in technology today. And so uh, saying that I'm working on cloud computing doesn't necessarily mean I'm doing things special and different. I'm working on technology. Right. And I think super cloud is really going to be nothing more than an abstraction of that technology, which is still going to be a cloud into itself. What is going to be unique about the super cloud is it doesn't rely on a particular vendor who owns it. It's in essence a stack and a logical layer that sits above the various cloud providers. So it's not going to be static. It's always going to be different, uh, the different ways that people deploy it. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a concept, um, you know, very much like virtualization was a concept and very much like, you know, data abstraction, all these other things, which was served us well over time, but a more valuable concept in the fact that we're leveraging existing technology in a certain configuration that's going to be able to provide more value. So it's an architecture at the end of the day, and it's always going to be an architecture. I suspect there's not going to be a company that steps up and go, we're going to be a super cloud and do everything that a super cloud does. It's just not going to exist. Everybody's requirements are going to be different, whether it's security, governance, performance, things like that. Mm -hmm. And the architects are the ones that kind of lead the day in your ability to define these things, configure optimized technologies around making this happen. The thing that concerns me now is the fact that we have lots of people out there who are trying to you know, get into the space and are defining it differently. And there's usually going to be one way to do it in an optimized way for a particular problem domain. Mm -hmm. And there's not going to be a cookie cutter kind of technology stack. In other words, we're not going to have one stack that works the same way at the same level of optimization in every enterprise. They have to be customized and reconfigured and configured in tune for the particular enterprise. But the reality is you're building technology that's going to take you on for the next 20, 30 years. So you might as well do it right. But we're building on existing technology. We're typically not replacing things. We're dealing, we're, we're dealing with good optimized architectures. We're dealing with core best practices that are starting to emerge. Mm -hmm. And we're making technology much more efficient, much more sustainable, which is what we should do as architects and solution developers. One, one last question then on that is that the idea of the super cloud also really includes good old fashioned data centers. It really is not only cloud, of course, it, correct me if I'm wrong. And that I think there was a time like, oh, 2012, 2014, when we looked ahead and said, you know what, data centers are dying, but here we are in 2022. Data centers are still very much alive. In fact, I hear a certain amount of repre repatriation, people taking things back down off the cloud, back to the data center, believe it or not. So the super cloud, actually also one of the elements of the super cloud is going to be a data center. True or not necessarily? Yeah, the data centers aren't going away. I mean, I, yeah. live, in Latin County, I live in Latin County, Virginia, and they're building a data center about <laughs> once every month here. Uh, the data center's you know, growth is going to be is just amazing. Well, these are doing cloud-based centers and things like that. So the growth of the cloud is driving some of that. Right. But the reality is that we're always going to have systems that are going to be local uh, to the environment, and they, they're uneconomically viable to move for most enterprises. And that's going to be about 30%, 20% of the systems built. And then that's perfectly fine. So you can move them to a co-location provider where you don't have to own the data center. You can move them to the managed service provider if you don't want to run them yourselves and all those sorts of things. But there's always going to be a certain amount of data centers that people are going to still walk into and still maintain moving forward just because of the viability of some of this technology 
that's not going to have an analog in the cloud or like I mentioned, was uneconomically viable. And that's perfectly fine. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but the price of hardware, you know, storage, you know, like a hard drive, a hard disk storage, um, if you look at it, I just did some research on this, has fallen substantially right. in the last 10 years. And so where we're doing this, it's going to make more sense for us to share storage space on the cloud and use the cloud provider as a storage system. If we're doing fairly simple things like just storage, storing petabytes of stuff, such as data and photos and a highly, uh, you know, highly uh, intensive uh, stuff, mm -hmm. it may make more viable sense that we, we do repatriate them and move them to data centers. You mm -hmm. know, one of the things at Deloitte, we're not selling cloud, we're selling solutions. Right. In many instances, if it's more functionally viable for you to use the thing on premise and you're going to pay less, you know, probably even burn less power in many instances. Right. then go ahead and make the move. And we're seeing that happen today. People are normalizing, not necessarily repatriating as much, but they're saying, okay, if I have petabytes of storage that exists out here on the cloud and it costs me so much money to do egress and sending data to it and, and pulling data from it, mm -hmm. why don't I just own the infrastructure? And let's look at the, let's run the numbers and see what it looks like doing that. Wow, for the next 10 years, it's going to save me 50% money. So, you know, make the move. And, you know, I have those conversations all the time. They're always taken back by, well, aren't you the cloud guy, Dave? <laughs> but no, no, I'm the, I'm the make the right architecture decision guy, whatever technology you need to put in place, you know, right. to make it work, who cares? Right. And if you're able to do better with on-premise technology, that's, that, that's fine by me. As long as you're able to keep up with security and operations and reliability and all those things seem to be fairly, you know, fairly well done. You know, so we're seeing lots of companies that actually were born in the cloud, may have built a business in the cloud, such as a file server storage system or file backup system mm -hmm. that just realized that what they did was very simplistic and didn't necessarily need the processes of the cloud and find they could get better capacity and, and uh, better efficiency on some of the on-premise stuff. So they move it on-premise and absolutely should be no, no, no issues with that. Yeah. Dave, I think you said it. It's um, I certainly learned a lot. Uh, it's going to be a really fascinating sector to, to follow in the years ahead. I'm going to start using the, the phrase super cloud more. Uh, and thank <laughs> you very much. You got it. Anytime.